I am May Habib. I am the CEO and co-founder of Writer. We are a generative AI platform, which means we are the large language model, plus all of the tools and software that enterprises need to build useful applications. Awesome. So May, your response to us talking about what this podcast is going to be is something that I've heard you say before, which is this is scary to me, and therefore we should give it a try. And I want to dig into that a little bit. Where did you learn this of going for the scary thing? Wow, that is deep, Alora. I have been so fortunate and privileged in my life for sure, 100%. You know, I probably had to do some pretty scary things when I was younger on a regular basis kind of putting myself out there when you are the oldest child of an immigrant family. And I think this will be resonant with folks who have played this role. uh, You're kind of the navigator and you are often in uncomfortable situations. So I do think over time I've gotten comfortable being uncomfortable, being scared. I wouldn't say I seek it out by any means, but it's not unfamiliar. Tell me more about being the oldest daughter of an immigrant family. Where are you from originally? Tell us a little bit more about that. I was born in rural Lebanon in a village in a province called Akkad. It's on the Syrian border. My family left in 1990. There were probably like 10 houses in my village uh, when I was born. My parents you know, worked the fields. It was kind of off the grid, out of the Lebanese economy type of place. Not everybody really felt Lebanese. People didn't really feel Syrian either. It's an interesting place. And my mom just recently was telling me about her interview with the Canadian ambassador in Damascus. And I think I gave her a hug just a few days ago for folks listening, you know, war rages in the Middle East again, unfortunately. And my life is obviously very different now. And I gave her a big hug and she's visiting, visits often and said, thank you so much for getting us out of there. Because, Mm. you know, I would still be in that village. Honestly, I'd be married. I'd have like five kids. I kind of wish I had five kids now, but, you know, I definitely would have five kids then. And she told me that the ambassador looked at her and asked her why she wanted to leave. And she said, I want to take my kids from the war. She just remembers him like stamping that paper and handing it back to her, you know, welcome to Canada, lady. And yeah, that changed our life and changed the whole trajectory. Going with that through line of, you know, leaning into that discomfort and knowing that that's probably where the path is. Was that something you experienced maybe when you encountered the tech world in general as a woman? Talk to me a bit more about how this trajectory got you into tech in general, and then we can hone in more into AI. I have been in male-dominated environments for a long time. My first set of jobs were all working for my dad, and he had a tool and die shop in Windsor, Ontario. So we were in kind of that Detroit, Michigan automotive circle. It was all men, of course. There was always like one or two women in the office, but the whole factory was male and investment banking wasn't that different. So the sovereign wealth fund wasn't that different. I think writer is very different. I mean, I think we are almost half women and non-binary. And, you know, that was a very conscious choice. I'm in charge now and I don't want to work with only men as much as I love them. Yeah, I I never felt othered. I don't know that, you know, my comfortable being uncomfortable comes from the male dominated environments of, you know, manufacturing and banking and private equity and tech, but certainly familiar. Where are some moments where you've felt uncomfortable or afraid and then chose the less certain path? Oh, I do it all the time at Writer. Yesterday, we had an exec meeting where, you know, we were talking about bets for 2024 with asymmetric upside. And I told the team, you guys know me, I think much more incrementally unless forced into a corner. And I rely on you 
to make sure, you know, we are 80, 20, 80% scaling up everything that we know is working and working really well. And 20% doing stuff that we don't know work. And a bunch of things actually are going to impact what me and you do next year on the community and content front, Alora. So we should talk about them. But I am really cognizant that there is a bit of kind of immigrant paranoia and fear that can hold me back from taking big risks. And I'm really intentional on working against that, surrounding myself with people who don't think that way, doing things that scare me because it's uncertain. Do you see that as a quality that helps you specifically in the AI world? AI is, from what I've seen, There's like this weird balance of risk and doing what other people are doing and and things like that. So can you talk to me a little bit more about where the risk is that you feel is worth taking and the risk that, no, that's where danger lies. The reality of the technology that exists today, right? The multimodal stuff, the vision stuff, the stuff that we are doing and others are doing means we can very credibly walk into a meeting with enterprise leaders and say, what is your biggest problem in your whole business? What is your biggest problem? We can help you solve that. And there is a lot of inherent fear in applying this technology to those problems because everything from hallucination to copyright to legal to regulatory, people have to take a big leap of faith to be able to say, to trust the folks who haven't done the faith bit, have actually gone in and understood what we're doing, right? To say, this is going to work for the business and it's going to work for everything we're trying to do from a risk and regulatory and ethical perspective. And so our customers are taking a big risk in partnering with us because the technology is so exciting and what it enables is so breakthrough. We take risks in initially for us going to market that way, right? Doing the enterprise thing versus what really would have been easier in a lot of ways of, you know, asking folks to swipe a credit card and doing it small business style or consumer style. And I think for us, and in your part of this too, Laura, the real allure is solving hard problems, big problems, things that really help transform work. And, you know, the bigger companies employ more people. And so we're going to be able to have a bigger impact in a shorter period of time, being able to really access that. And those sometimes are the jobs that aren't as fun or are as creative. And there is something so awesome about this technology. Some of my favorite kind of attributes of it is it allows us to spend more of our week in inspired mode versus like cranking mode. And cranking mode is fun too. And you want that combination, but you know, not on stuff that's repetitive or boring or you figured out already. So it takes risk taking on both sides to make generative AI work. So I do think, you know, you're making me realize that maybe I am like a founder for the moment, given what it takes, because I am so conscious about putting ourselves in risk taking mode. I love that the vendor customer relationship in generative AI is different than in any other market. We're a few steps ahead of our customers, not by that many. And we are collaborative and open and transparent in a way that I don't think any other vendor customer relationship really is. And I don't know if that is the same at other AI companies, but certainly at Writer, we've gotten that feedback. And yeah, risk taking is is the heart of it, I think. What? about a specifically what gravitated you toward it what drew you initially it was really about nlp and ml ml and nlp is how we got transformers and ai feels like the category and the promise it certainly is you know automated intelligence i don't love the word artificial. But I do think the initial push into the field really came from the experiences I had in my childhood. So the first company that, well, first problem we started exploring, we built a company on top of the problem, but the first problem we started exploring is language translation. This is what Wasim and I started working on almost 10 years ago. And for me, the language you were born speaking shouldn't impact the kind of life you end up leading. 
And that was very much a lived experience that I had seeing my maybe aptitude or just the English language feeling much easier for me, both like I immigrated as a child, I love languages, all this stuff, versus folks who just had a tougher time. And everything from, you know, writing a resume to applying for a job. I mean, if you can't speak the language of your community fluently, you literally can't join the modern economy. (laughs) You live on the fringes of a society and it's so much harder to belong. Those experiences really, I think, shaped me, clearly shaped me because you got to bust through walls to, to build businesses and companies. And, you know, clearly, I think that has driven me for a long time. What's interesting now, Laura, is I think AI has both the potential and the risk to be 10, maybe 100 times more inequity creating or equity creating, right, depending on how we shape mm-hmm. it. Because when you look at our data, right, in our customer base, we survey folks on how much more productive they are with writer. And you've got kind of the average distribution, the folks in the middle, they're 50, 60 percent more productive. And folks are like, yes, right. The executives are like, you know, sign me up for more. This is perfect. But the extremities of that distribution, there are folks 200 percent more productive. Right. And there are folks that are not touching it at all. And so. As we think about bringing everybody along and enabling everybody, it is, I think, so important to think about equity and enabling people with AI with user experience in mind and enablement in mind, because we could end up with a really dystopian future where most jobs are done by AI employees and folks who already would have been top of the food chain, you know, that much more productive as a result of having all that leverage. So. You know, a lot of the same things that drove me from the beginning drive me now. And, you know, NLP got us here. And I think AI will get us to the next stage. Leaning into that discomfort. When do you feel like that it's working? And then when do you realize, oh, no, this this isn't a risk worth taking? When do you feel like, okay, this was definitely a great risk to make? I actually wish we failed more. Because I want more at-bats to be able to tell people that that's okay. I do think we are such thoughtful people. I don't think we overthink. You know, I think we're good at stopping ourselves from like, let's just, you know, let's just go. We talk about writer speed, right? A lot. Yeah, but I, bias I, toward I, action. Mm-hmm. Yeah, huge, huge. And everybody operates at every level. Like our leaders are so in the trenches, really leading from the front. And so... We get, I think as a result of that, everybody thinking really strategically while in action mode. But I I do wish that we failed more because I think it would mean that we were launching things and trying things at a pace where folks knew there was a chance of failure. So much of the last year has been writer in risk taking mode. A lot of what we've been doing has felt contrarian. We built our own models, even as folks said, hey, these frontier models are getting more powerful and cheaper. Why don't you just build on them? And that has really proven to be what the enterprise needs to build so many of these powerful, high impact internal use cases. I'm very happy we did that. Contrarian has also been the platform approach. Uh, shouldn't I just use this DB over here and this prompt chaining thing over here and this guardrails thing over there? And folks have ended up with non-scalable, non-production ready applications and proofs of concept. We put all of those tools in one platform. We gave folks the option to deploy writer in their own environments. And the rule of thumb in startup building is you force everybody into multi-tenant and you push back, you know, until you're at a bill ARR or et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, that has proven to be really important and I think an enduring variable and kind of pillar of what it's going to mean to be enterprise generative AI. And so we've had to take risks. And they haven't been kind of, you know, completely gut driven. It has been one customer here, two customers here, a prospect there, 
you know, us really doing what a startup should do, which is find signal and noise, marry that to conviction and experience and just take risk. So, you know, that formula has proven out. And my goal now is to scale that formula and have as many people in the company as possible, as many CEOs and CTOs and continue to build and grow, building the leading enterprise generative AI platform. I'm so excited about this conversation series because I can't overemphasize how much risk enterprise generative AI leaders take today. You are sticking your neck out at so many different levels, technology and adoption and use cases and the future and what this looks like morally for how it transforms people's lives and jobs. And there's a reason people do that. You don't stick your neck out when there is so much uncertainty, when a platform is so new, when you don't have a framework or a personal story that has led to that framework that allows you to like sleep at night. And I do know I was having dinner with a CIO of a Fortune 200 company and it was like 1030 at night and he had two espresso martinis because he was still working <laughs> and he was going to be getting up at 5 a.m. and going to continue. So I do think that there's something driving all of us. And I think it's a pretty special, special moment. So I'm really excited to be capturing these stories.